All right. So um, what I want to talk a little bit about is basically 19th century uh, postal stationery, the high value issues. And um, what the slide that we're seeing here shows the, uh, the stamps and envelopes that were available in 1851 in a kind of purple and then the stamp issues that came, envelope issues that came out in 1861 and 1863 slash four. The point that I'm trying to make is that from about 1861 until 1894, the post office had a policy of basically having an envelope for every denomination of stamp that was issued. And um, if we go then to 1870, it becomes a, a little bit more clear. Again, you see on the right, the uh, in the uh, purple, uh, the stamp issues, and then the envelopes from 1870 to 1894. So for that uh, basically 30 year period, the policy of the post office was to issue an en stamped envelope for every denomination of stamp that was issued. Now, uh, a couple of things then about these higher value ones, and I'm basically going to focus on the 12 cents and above. Um, first, uh, let's back up and uh, just a bit more information. Uh, during this time, uh, our stamps have generally been produced on a four year contract with a private company. They've never been printed uh, by a government office as stamps and uh, postal cards have been. The uh, first contract period from 1852 to 1870 was by George Nesbitt. And you know, it's just, just kind of interesting me to think about this. When he took over the contract in 1852, the uh, numbers indicate that the largest stationary producer in New York was producing 20,000 envelopes a year. And the contract for the US Post Office was for 2 million envelopes. So he was agreeing to produce 100 times more envelopes than anybody else had ever produced it in that in a year. And uh, he basically developed an awful lot of equipment for the uh, mechanization of envelope production. But anyway, George Nesbitt had the contract from 52 to 70. Uh, then George Ray had the contract from uh, 1870, one four year contract to 74. And then the Plimpton Manufacturing Company and later Plimpton and Morgan held the contract for 20 years from 1874 to 1890. So I'm just going to run through a few of these a little bit quickly and, and show some of the high value envelopes. The things to keep in mind are, uh, and uh, Dick, I'm taking some of this from some of your slides, but the concepts are appropriate, that high denomination envelopes paid multiples of common rates. They were basically used for commercial mail or legal documents and often business to business. And therefore, the survival rates of the high value envelopes are much less than the survival rates of stamped, stamps on envelopes and, and other things, uh, because those tended to be more personal letters. The other thing that you'll see as we go through here is the condition is often an issue because these higher value envelopes were a larger size. So vertical folds are common to put them into a file. And uh, further, uh, there's oftentimes edge damage from use and or from later storage. So with that, uh, these are actually uh, taking a little bit from Dick's area, but the uh, first issue in the 60s were the bicolor envelopes, which I think are just beautiful, but they're incredibly rare. And, uh, and expensive. Uh, the most common use of actually all of the high value envelopes was by express companies. So I'm showing here a Bamber and Company Express that uh, was using a 12 cent bicolor envelope. Uh, 
I would argue that stamped envelopes were issued primarily so the post office could collect money from the express companies for envelopes that never entered the mail, which is actually still the case today. But uh, so these companies uh, put their francs on. Here is, um, to me, a nice little one, uh, paste up uh, three cent plus the 12 cent. Uh, the encouragement was for the express companies to, if they didn't have the right postage, not to add a stamp, but rather to paste envelopes together. So, um, and I, there's several reasons for this, but uh, anyway, there are two examples. Uh, here is a nice example of Dick's. Uh, I think Dick, this is the only uh, 12 cent to a foreign country. Uh, you see a nice 30 cent stamp and two two cents, so 40 cents rate for 15 cent. NGU closed mail via Great Britain with a one cent overpayment. A beautiful item and uh, the only known copy to a foreign country. Um, here's an example of uh, this going back to a Wells Fargo, but a, a rare 20 cent used uh, westbound for two times the 10 cent California rate. And it doesn't look very pretty, but it's probably the only one there is. Here are a couple of the uh, next issue of envelopes. Uh, in 63 and 64, uh, Nesbitt issued high value envelopes of a single color. Uh, he essayed by color again, but was wanting to charge more and the post office wasn't willing to pay for it. So they went back to a single color. The uh, nine cent envelopes were of course for three times the three cent rate. Uh, again, these are very scarce without a Wells, without an express company, Frank. Uh, both of these have a return address. In the 60s, uh, a lot of the companies were uh, putting, well, in fact, the U.S. government first printed uh, return addresses vertical on the left side. Uh, what you see on the bottom one is a government printed corner card. Um, again, a very scarce copy is the only reported such copy of a nine cent envelope with a government printed corner card. The uh, 12 cents are uh, uh, slightly more common. Uh, they were basically here for four times the three cent rate. And you'll notice that according to Dick's uh, census, we think about 10 to 15 of these exist. So none of these are very common. Uh, here is a wonderful envelope. It looks all beat up, but it's the 18 cent rate, uh, six times three cents plus 10 cent registry. And uh, that was sent around and actually used and returned for a seven times three cents with a 10 cent registry. Very unusual, certainly a unique item. The uh, 24 cent uh, envelopes were again used primarily by express companies. And I've never seen a 24 cent envelope without uh, a Wells Fargo franc on it. And even with these francs, we think only 20 to 30 such items exist. I uh, having said that, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, here, Dick, I don't know if you've seen this. This is my copy of the 24 cent without a Wells Fargo franc registered to England, and it would be the only such reported used copy. Uh, 30 cent uh, covers uh, without Wells Fargo, Frank, the top one is a very nice one uh, with a uh, steamship mar marking and rate, uh, three times 10 cents, likely from Panama. Uh, Dick's uh, census currently has about 16 used copies of the 30 cent, six of went, which went through the postal service as these did. Um, 40 cent envelopes with Wells Fargo francs. Uh, both of these are nice envelopes uh, used from Mexico uh, with the uh, Mexican and California Express $1.40 surcharge. 
two of five known copies used of the 40 cents, so very scarce items. The uh, next contract was George Ray in 1870 for four years. He only had the contract for four years, so not so many envelopes. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out is I went back to the Postmaster General's report and Ray, according to those reports, sold about 490 million three cent envelopes, 490 million. And then you go to the high values, 23,000 for the 12 cent, 3,400 for the 15 and on down to 900 for the 90 cent. And uh, John Barr was published an article a few years ago on scarcity. Uh, he used as an example, the first Victoria stamp and then the five and 10 cent first US stamp. And he came to the conclusion that the survivability of those items was about two to five per 10,000. And so you can imagine as you look at these high value envelopes here that uh, with less than a 10,000 printing, we wouldn't expect very many copies to exist. And in fact, they don't. Here are uh, two nice 12 cents with the uh, Wells Fargo Frank. The upper one, of course, is from the Mexican post office. The bottom one uh, was a uh, a paste up or attached to uh, some other package. The thing that's a little bit unusual is it's on amber paper. Wells Fargo did use some, but mainly stuck with white paper. Here is um, a 12 cent, uh, again with a government printed corner card on top, four times three cent rate, uh, it was pre-addressed, uh, an interesting cover. The, um, the cover on the bottom, the 12 cent, is, is quite interesting. Uh, it was sent by a stamp dealer, uh, Coleman, to uh, England, and it's sent registered. And so the question would be, is how could he do that uh, with a 10 cent registry fee? And the answer is that he sent it uh, third class. So the rate was one or two cents. Uh, we don't know how what weight he had in there, but it was one or two cents for two to four ounces, for either up to two or for two to four ounces. So he either uh, had uh, a one cent overpayment, which was still cheaper than paying the, the first class rate, or he uh, was sending something weighing two to four ounces. Uh, very uh, unusual envelope. Here is uh, Ray issue, uh, the only 24 cent envelope I'm aware of without an express company Frank on it. Uh, this <coughs> be for the uh, eight times, uh, actually three cent rate, uh, eight times three, I'm sorry, I made a mistake on that slide. So it's four ounces total. And I think if you look around the edges, you can see that there is folding on the edges. There actually was some weight of material in there, but a uh, unique item. Uh, moving on to the 30 cent uh, REA envelopes, uh, a nice um, 30 cent with 30 additional cents added postage. Uh, so when was this mailed or what was the rate? Well, from, uh, as I'll show you in a minute, from February 1871 to 76, Germany had a seven cent rate. So it had to be before 71 or after 76. And um, my guess would be it's the latter, but we can't tell for sure. Um, here is the only 90 cent rie I've seen uh, used uh, on amber paper. A beautiful cover to Munich. So that would be 16 times the five cent international rate. This was sent in 1893 and uh, 10 cents registry. It's uh, not uncommon for these envelopes to be used later than they were issued. So this was used in 93. It was printed before 74, so it was about 20 years old when it was mailed. 
Uh, one of the things I want to just uh, mention quickly, I said I'd stay above the 12 cents, but an interesting issue is the 7 cent rate. I referred to the 7 cent per half ounce rate to the North German Union. Um, the post office issued 7 cent stamps and they were most commonly used, but the REA also issued uh, 7 cent envelopes. Uh, the report is that 29,000 envelopes were reported. Uh, Markovitz reported 26 used, and we can argue up or down based on the usages a little bit, but uh, that kind of gives you an idea again of uh, in that three to five per thousand rate that I was telling you. Here is the one of two known uh, of these covers that are double rate, so a seven cent stamp on the seven cent envelope. And then uh, lastly, here is, a, I think it's a pretty cover. It's actually a 10 cent rate to Denmark, uh, upgraded with the three cent stamp, but during that period. One of the things that is interesting is, uh, so Ray, printed 29,000 of these seven cent envelopes. Plimpton, when he got the contract in 1874, printed 3,250 of those envelopes. You can tell the difference between the dies in that the uh, seven cent has a curl on the bottom of the Plimpton indicium. We are not aware of any used copies of the seven cent Plimpton. So I don't know where all the 3,200 envelopes went, but there are no known used copies for this rate to Germany. The um, last set of contracts then would be the Plimpton contracts that I mentioned for the 20 years from 1874 to 1894. Uh, Again, just to give you that same benchmark, during that 20 year period, they, public, they manufactured 6 billion envelopes, billion with a B. At the same time, if you come look at the uh, higher values, you see that the volumes printed was generally about 2,500 up to, in the case of the 15 cent envelope, 34,000. So a very low press run, and then, of course, the other thing is that uh, we'll talk about this uh, <clears throat> halfway through this 20 year period, the color of the stamps were changed to 30 cents to brown and 90 cents to purple. And so then the uh, postal stationery was changed in color from a black indicia to brown and a carmine to a purple indicia. <laughs> so let's just. Uh, it kind of surprised me looking at those numbers, but the 15 cent was the uh, largest press run of these envelopes. And again, they were uh, either four or five times the three cent rate, as you see on the top envelope, or with a registry fee, and then uh, maybe two times that. Here are two of the 15 cent envelopes used to Germany. I remember I'm particularly not showing express company envelopes. Um, that was a 15 cent with five cents added. So it was two times five cents plus the 10 cent registry fee. On the bottom, we had uh, additional to get up to six times weight. My point in all this, that while you can see particularly the bottom envelope looks a little beat up, they were actually carrying a lot of weight in them. And that's hard on, you can imagine, envelopes moving through the mail, in the bags, on the ships, and across the, the continent to uh, uh, Vienna in this case. Here is a 15 cent. Uh, I got in a, a Shiler Rumsey sale, and it is the only known copy of the 15 cent on this size envelope. This is what we call a jumbo size. Uh, it had not previously been listed in any catalog over the last uh, uh, 70 years. And uh, so it is the only known used copy, either mint or used, 
it's a little bit unusual for Wells Fargo to have gotten, the color doesn't show up good, but it's a, a pinkish or an oriental buff. Uh, the 30 cent envelopes uh, from the first 10 years of their production, here's a nice example uh, to Germany, four times the five cent rate per half ounce registered. And then on the uh, lower portion with an added stamp to give us a uh, five times the five cent rate and the 10 cent registry fee. Uh, again, these are very scarce items. Here is the only known used copy of the 30 cent envelopes to uh, South America, to Caraco. Uh, it was mailed in the 1880s. Uh, not too long after it was produced, 10 cent registry. You see it has a, a nice stamp on the back from A.G. Dixon as general agent, and then uh, was uh, shipped via the uh, Red D line, a beautiful cover. Uh, here are some other of the, uh, this would be the, um, 30 cent Plimptons now after the color change. If you look, the previous ones were black. Now we're into the brown cover. Again, changed to match the color of the stamp. Um, the top cover is to Holland, uh, 30 cents plus 15 cents. So it's seven times the half ounce rate for the 10 cent registry fee. The bottom one is on Oriental Buff, which again is the colored papers are much more scarce. Maybe the only copy, uh, four times the uh, five cent rate plus a 10 cent registry fee. Uh, here are uh, some small sizes. A little bit surprising really that you can get that weight in these small cent envelopes, but I think you can see the blue one up on top. Uh, was folded over on the edge uh, to uh, include some weight, but it was 35 cents. So it was uh, two and a half ounces with a 10 cent registry fee. The bottom one is uh, 30 cent uh, to um, Sweden, which is uh, again, somewhat of an unusual destination. Most of the foreign covers that we see were sent to uh, to Germany or Austria. Here is a, a beat up cover, but I think it's a wonderful cover. It's obviously philatelic. It was mailed in 19, I can't see the date, the uh, screens are over, but I think it's 06. Uh, it uh, went to China. Uh, it was uh, eight times the five cent rate and the 10 cent registry fee. So even though it's philatelic and late, it's a wonderful cover. It has a nice San Francisco registration label, which are only a fraction of the New York labels. Uh, here is a, what I thought was an interesting cover. This is blue paper. It's a small size, both of which are scarce. A 10 cent stamp added for 40 cents for a local use in New York. Uh, so somebody was mailing something of some value to them and, uh, and use that just for mailing within the city of New York. One of the uh, things I wanna mention, just like in all kinds of areas, we have people that operate just a little bit under the table. And one of the changes with the colors in uh, 1886, uh, the, um, again, if you remember, I said that the uh, postal stationary contracts were let on four year periods. Uh, and then what they did, if you look at the bottom, the 1880, two to four, was uh, that kind of watermark, a US with an 82. And then in uh, 86, they went to this watermark with the interlinked US. Well, the watermark paper arrived slightly before the color change occurred. 
And uh, of course, it didn't make any difference on the three cent and five cent envelopes since they didn't change color. But uh, four stamp uh, big names, uh, you see them there, Kalman, uh, Bozier, Rocher, and Holton um, got wind of this and they ordered some 30 cent and 90 cent envelopes after the new watermark paper was in, but before the color had changed to brown and purple. So they got them in black and carmine. Uh, there are all these small size envelopes. Uh, I throw this up here. Uh, there was a big hue and cry in the philatelic literature that time about the uh, under underhanded and things that were going on. Um, we do not know of any used copies of these envelopes. And I think you can understand they got them, they intended to sell them mint, they wouldn't devalue them with a the use. Having said that, you're looking at one that has a third class cancel. Um, even though I own it, I am not going to change the catalog to list that as used because I think that was the third class cancel, so it didn't have a date in it. It was probably a late cancel. It was in Boston, uh, so it would have been between our uh, syndicate members. And I think it was very much a favor cancel just for the purpose of showing that one was used. Uh, if you look at the envelope, you can see there's no way that it could have carried, uh, at that time, the postage rate was two cents, so it would have been 15 times, 15 ounces worth of material. Um, so my point here is that's the only known canceled one, and we won't change our catalog listings to accommodate this because I think it was just a favor canceled. Uh, going on to the 90 cent Plimpton envelopes, uh, here's a nice 90 cent used to uh, Cologne, Germany. And it was just for 18 times the half ounce rate or nine ounces. That was a heavy envelope. As you can see from the edges, the way it had fold around that that could well be. You can also see if you've seen on many of the envelopes as I mentioned in the second slide or so, most of them have a vertical fold because they were folded and put into a file cabinet. Here is a nice uh, 90 cent uh, used to Germany. Uh, it was registered. Uh, and again, you can see because of the weight inside, the post office actually put a postal seal on it and it has a hand stamp over uh, that in back, which I blew up says received uh, in Chicago in bad condition, basically. This is a two cents convenience overpayment, mailed in 1894. Here's another example of a 90 cent envelope mailed to Germany, 16 times the uh, five cent rate for eight ounces and registered. And again, uh, because it was kind of falling apart, the post office put postal seals on it before it was sent abroad. Here is a, an envelope that I have, a 90 cent with a cancel unaddressed. And I think that this was uh, basically used as a paste up, that it was attached to some box or something that was shipped and had a, a shipping order in it, that sort of thing. Uh, interesting potential. Canceled in Kansas City, no address, but probably not philatelic. Here is a, a beautiful 90 cent mail from Boston to Milwaukee. Again, I'm going to classify this as philatelic. Uh, it's got a third class cancel, so there's no date on it. Uh, again, you know, the third class rate at this point was one cent per two ounces. And there's no way they would have got 180 ounces in that envelope. So, and it's a beautiful envelope flat. It doesn't show the rumpling on the edges of some of the used envelopes. So I think it was a favor cancel sent to uh, Schrader in Milwaukee. 
Here are a couple of uh, envelopes that were actually mailed. Uh, this again now is the last half of the 10 year period of Plimpton. Uh, they're purple instead of red as the previous ones. Um, nice one to Germany and forwarded. Uh, and the bottom one to Germany as well, which also was an amber paper. Again, uh, if you, uh, you probably don't remember, but there was a surge in purchase of 90 cent envelopes of the purple type. And I believe looking at the annual sales that what happened is a bunch of dealers decided that they needed to get some envelopes. And so I think that probably half of the sales or more of the 90 cent purple envelopes were to stamp dealers. And then they were used at various times afterwards. So in summary, I think if we look across all of these covers, uh, John Barwis's recommendations hold up, or maybe we're even a tad lower, that the survival rate of used high value envelopes is roughly two to five per 10,000 or less. And uh, particularly less if we did not count the stamp dealer covers. The the end then was that in 1894, the government decided to quit issuing envelopes for every stamp denomination that it had and came out with the one, two, four, and five cent, which they basically continued up until around World War II or a little bit later uh, in the 1950s. Uh, the use of high value Envelopes though continued and you see uh, these envelopes uh, though production ended in 84, 94, you see a lot of uses up to 1900 and even into the early 1900s. And most of these are stamp dealer usages. So thank you for your time. Any comments or questions? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Dan. Beautiful material, Dan. Yeah. But it's pretty scarce. Dick holds uh, most of the uh, Nesbitt material, and I hold quite a bit of the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Sure. You talked about the uh, change in the die between the uh, Rhea and Plimpton issues. Right. I'm wondering if there's anything else you can say about the dies. I realize that these are limited quantities. They didn't have as much of a run as the much lower denominations, but were, are there any other changes in the dies that you could talk about going forward? Oh, for the seven cents specifically? Not for the seven cents specifically, I mean, just in general, um, it seems like an area that is interesting, but you, you're primarily talking about rates. Uh, yeah, so um, the first thing is that um, Plimpton had to read, uh, make their own dies when they got the contract. They did not get the dies from the previous contract holder. So the engraver made the dies slightly differently. So we can identify Rie from Plimpton dies. Um, on the other hand, and that's true for every denomination. Uh, on the other hand, the printing of these envelopes was so low that there probably was never more than one die made by each company. And so we see no variation among the envelopes printed by a particular company. Uh, that's different than say the three cent envelopes. When they printed billions, they had a lot of working dies and you can identify different working die types. But um, for these high value envelopes, there undoubtedly was only one die made, so there are no variations in die type. Does that answer your question? It does, thank you. I have a question kind of connected with that. Um, 
what was the actual physical process like here? They they embossed it to raise the image and then they put the ink on later or did it all happen at once? Uh, it, it all happened at once is the short answer to your question. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the way these dyes were grazed, what is embossed here was cut into the dye. So in all stamps with embossing, the colored area is the flat area. And then what is embossed in the stamp was sunken in the dye and so it's white because it did not receive any ink when the dye was inked. Do you follow what I'm saying? Maybe. So, so uh, the, the head of the person there was like lower in the dye. Correct. The paper got pushed down into there, but there was no ink down there. Correct. Because the ink had been sort of smeared over the high part of the dye. Correct. Yeah. Ah, fascinating. Thanks. Dan, it's Melanie. Can you speak a little bit about the watermarks for this, these envelopes? Sure. Um, until, you know, and my memory is failing me, but until about 1970, the post office required that postal stationery have watermarks. Might have been in the 80s. Um, the first contractor, which I told you was Nesbitt, used one watermark for his entire period uh, of 18 years. After that, then every four-year contract basically had at least one different watermark. So we can tell when an envelope was manufactured in large amount by the watermark. We can assign it to a four-year period of envelope production. Even though Plimpton had the contract for 20 years and actually 10 years more, uh, they every four years changed the watermark. Does that kind of tell you, answer your question or do you have other? Um, were there certain designs in the watermark stand for these? Yes, uh, and almost all of them had a, a U.S. or a U.S. POD, Post Office Department. Um, those are all um, shown in actually both Scott catalog and our postal stationery catalog do show a listing of all the watermarks that were used over the years. There's about uh, uh, about 50 of them. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about the paper quality? With, were they using special kinds of paper? Yes, uh, by all means. Um, so the, the paper was always rag paper up well into the 20th century, meaning cotton fiber. The uh, white paper was, you know, they used to go around and collect jeans and old clothing. And that actually was used to make paper up until into about 1900. Um, the uh, higher quality cotton was used to make white paper. And then if the cotton was dirtier, they couldn't get the the cotton cleaned when they dissolved the cotton from the clothes, uh, then they would add some colorants. And that's where the amber or yellow, or I showed you that oriental buff, that was basically to hide dirty cotton. <laughs> the uh, paper was always specified in terms of weight. Um, when they let out uh, samples, they actually put together a, a packet of envelopes and said the quality has to be like these. 
So are there special specimens for postal stationery? Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, I have a book on that. <laughs> and uh, and so they issued specimens for purpose. The most common purpose of specimens was to promote the use of envelopes. They would print a specimen on it to uh, make it no longer able to be used for postage and then hand out examples at post offices and other places uh, and uh, encourage people to use them. But another use of the specimens was to take envelopes and stamp it with a specimen and produce these bitter sample packages. Can I ask a question about costs? Um, how, how much did, a, let's say, a 90 cent envelope cost? Well, it depends a lot on the markings and use. Um, no, I don't mean uh, collector's value. I mean from the post office. Oh, um, back at that time, uh, and that's the other thing, that postal stationery has always been sold for the cost of the stamp plus the cost of manufacture. Uh, stamps and postcards are sold just for the value of the stamp, and envelopes are sold for the postage plus the cost of manufacture. But that was not significant. Uh, oh, in the um, in the 1860s, it was about a tenth of a cent additional per envelope. And in the 1890s, it fell down to actually around a hundredth of a cent additional. And then if you haven't followed this uh, over the last 20 years, now it's climbed up to about 70 cents additional. <laughs> That's a wonderful exegesis on your collection. I'm wondering if there's anything waiting in the wings, something that you're looking for that's maybe within reach? Um, well, I'm still hoping to find one or two more. Uh, I don't have a 24 cent Plimpton envelope used and uh, hopefully one of those will turn up at some point in time. Uh, I would like a 90 cent Ray at some point used I'm real big on wanting to have envelopes used within period. And the number that I've showed you are about all that exist, but many of them have been used by dealers as we showed you 10 or 15 years, some cases 20 years after they were manufactured. I'd rather see them used within the contract period. So yeah, there are a few things that I'm keeping my eyes open, but. Uh, well, good luck. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have the Nesbitt 20 and the 25 used. Uh, 25? 24, you mean? Oh, yeah, Nesbitt. Whatever it is. There are three, there are four envelopes. I don't have the 40. Uh, I have the other three. The 12, the 20, and the 24, is it? Yeah, those are nice items. I thought you might have something in that area. Yeah, and they're very nice copies, uh, good condition. I'll send you scans. I'm sure Dick's still listening. He will probably uh, want to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah, I've seen those, Dan. They're the the 20, 20 in particular is especially nice. Mine goes to Panama. Right, right. He would send me scans of those. Uh, oh, I did. Year, I did already. So back, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful item. Well, that's one of the things I mentioned. A lot of scarcity along the way here, but uh, Dick is doing a real nice census of all of the uh, uh, Nesbit envelopes, the first two issues, the bicolor and the single colors. And uh, if you look at those numbers I put on the slides that are his. Um, there's not many copies of most of them known. Now, how many copies of the 40 cent Nesbitt are known as envelopes? I, the uh, the bicolor? Yes. I, I, I'm guessing probably either around five or six used copies. That's, that's all I've ever seen. Uh, Dick, uh, a little bit cautious, but he he has five in his 
expenses, right? I showed you here two of five known. Oh, we're, oh, we're talking about the uh, the buy color, 40 cents. Oh, buy color, I'm sorry. Yeah. But it, it, it's about the same for the uh, the 1865. Yeah. The 40 cent pink. So it's a it's a fascinating area. They're really scarce. Uh, uh, the the whole production of these is something that a lot of people uh, don't realize what all goes into them. And um, it, it, I, I just have developed a great appreciation for all of these. When you have one, think of what it's been through and still exists. <laughs> Dan, do these get demonetized or can they be used indefinitely? Uh, all of the stamp envelopes after the first two issues can be used indefinitely. The first two issues were demonetized, well, and not all, but uh, all of the five and 10 cent of the first issue and uh, the uh, uh, three and six and 10 of the second issue were demonetized because of the Civil War. How many official stamps are used on these big denominational envelopes? You know, I don't uh, have any information on that. Um, they're scarce, I know, by the price we put in the catalog. Uh, the person to talk to about that is out of Texas. I'm drawing a mental blank on his name. Uh, Dennis, Dennis Schmidt. Yeah, thank you. Dennis Schmidt. <laughs> uh, he probably has as many as anybody and probably knows as much about what exists. Dan, did Nesbitt and these other companies make their own paper or did they get it from another manufacturer? Uh, no. Manu no postal envelope manufacturing company ever made its own paper. They always bought from other sources. Okay. We're a little bit unsure of where Nesbitt got his from. We have some ideas. Uh, the other companies are known and reported in our catalog. And in, in many cases, um, well, it was particularly once we got into the 1900s, the envelope manufacturers would buy from two or maybe even three companies just to make sure that they could uh, have a constant supply. And then that was a period when each company would put its own watermark in the paper so that the post office could track any issues back to a paper manufacturer. Uh, kind of an interesting point. Back in the mid 1860s, the Civil War era, the paper variation on the Nesbitt envelopes was just all over the place. I mean, yeah. particularly, I've, I've looked a lot at the 10 cent 1861s and the the paper variation in, in on those envelopes is just all over the map. Buff colors really, from from buff really, to yellow to orange and yeah. That was really the beginning of paper manufacture. And, uh, and he had a hard time uh, during the Civil War uh, getting paper. That was yeah. partly why they raised his contract rate, a number of other things. But uh, it is quite variable. And, you know, again, the uh, same kind of thing happened during World War I and before. Uh, we used to get a lot of our products for printing ink and for manufacturing from Germany. And when an embargo was put on that material by England, uh, we had significant variability in the envelopes uh, from about 1814 up to 1820, ah, 1914 to 1920, excuse me. 